Okay, welcome back everybody who's uh, in the main room and not the breakout sessions and everybody who's joining us online as well. Um, earlier I talked about when you add all the businesses together in both the mutual and cooperative businesses, the democratic economy, you get to a total 87 billion uh, pounds into the UK economy and uh, 77 million memberships. Uh, the representatives from the corporates and mutuals that you see here are a big part of that. Um, and as we heard in the session earlier, uh, not many people know about us. So that's what we're going to be uh, talking about now. The feeling is mutual. And I've got the best moderator I could possibly ask for in this session, an absolutely stalwart of cooperation from Co-op News that does have a stand, and you are able to pick up your <laughs> copy of Co-op News, but I'm going to allow her to reduce, introduce the rest of the panel, but I'd like to welcome, please, Rebecca Harvey, Executive Editor, Co-op News. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rose. It's delighted. I'm delighted to be here, and it's so lovely to see, see so many of you today. I mean, what a busy time it's been for mutuality recently. We've had the Coventry Building Society bringing the Cop Bank back into mutualism. <laughs> We've got the Labour Manifesto launched um, this week at the Cop Group headquarters in Manchester. It's reaffirming its commitment to double the size of the Cop economy. And today we have five brilliant people from the co-op and mutual sectors who will be drilling down into how co-op and mutuals can work better together. Because let's face it, we can be working better together. We'll hear over the next few days at Congress um, how co-ops and mutuals have some genuinely impactful stories to tell. And we heard a little bit about that this morning as well. So why aren't we telling them together? Why are co-ops and mutuals still so misunderstood? I think part of it is down to the language and perception, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But before I introduce the panel, uh, I have a quick question for everybody here. It's more hand-raising, I'm afraid. If a friend came up to you, or someone in the street, and said to you, hey, co-ops and mutuals, what's the difference? Who could give a really succinct answer without using Google or using your phone? How many people? One, two, is that two, three? three people. I think that's quite telling. Um, so we'll have a little bit more on that later. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our panel today. We have Jim Islam, the Chief Executive from One Family. We have Sheila Hancock, who's the Chief Executive of First Milk. We have Shireen Curry-Hack, Chief Executive of the Co-op Group. We have Kevin Parry, Chair of Nationwide and Royal London, and we have Paul Dover, who's the UK Agricultural Director of Arles. There's lots of big brains on this stage today. Thank you all so much for coming. I really, really appreciate you making the time today. Um, I'm going to start with a quick question for you all on how does being a Culpa Mutual inform how you run your business? How do you tell your Culpa Mutual story to your members and to the public? Um, Jim, I'm going to start with you here, if that's OK. Can you tell us a bit more about One Family for those who are not familiar with your organisation? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Good uh, morning, everyone. Um, One Family is a financial services mutual. It provides investment, savings, and life insurance uh, products. Um, uh, we have 1.6 million customers who are also our members. Uh, so we are a member-owned organization. Um, when we uh, look at sort of what the role that we play, uh, there's also a question of why. And therefore, I would like to step back a bit, and because this is how we have developed our strategy as well as our response uh, uh, in terms of some of the challenges we have. So we talk about uh, five key trends that are, we feel are well established in the UK. And we see our role in the context of those five key trends. And that will also highlight what we are doing in terms of responding to that. The first one we call out as threadbare safety nets. And as it suggests, clearly with the uh, fiscal position uh, that we have in the UK, uh, the element of financial protection that the state used to provide, it's receding. Uh, some of that uh, has been addressed, for example, for retirement savings through pensions, automatic enrollment, which has been a great success. Uh, but there are many other gaps. Uh, seven out of 10 uh, people in the UK don't have life insurance. 
so there is a need to provide low-cost, accessible life insurance products. And accessibility is something that's core to our delivery. Um, some of the entry points for our savings products are actually quite low. Um, and in order to address the threadbare safety nets challenge that we have in the UK, we recently acquired an online digital uh, life insurer called Beagle Street. That's the brand under which uh, we sell our protection product. But that is enabling us to create greater accessibility, uh, but also provide the financial protection uh, that is needed. The second trend um, is uh, the lack of social mobility. Social mobility in the UK has stalled. Uh, one of the great things about our business is that amongst our 1.6 million customers, a large proportion are uh, young people. Uh, that is because, uh, this is in the previous Labour government, there was a product called Child Trust Funds. Uh, we are the largest child trust fund provider in the UK with uh, a 25% market share. What that means is that one out of four, every 18-year-old during the last few years and the next few years is our customer but it enables us to actually understand what they want and what the challenges are. We know from our research that when we look at Gen Z and millennials, um, uh, a third of them have deprioritized savings for a property. Uh, they've just not, you know, they think that they can do that. Uh, we also know from our research for 18 to 40 uh, year olds that uh, almost 60% were struggling to save because of rising food costs. Um, so there is definitely a need to, in order to create social mobility, the need to create products that enable people to save. We feel that some of the products are there, such as Lifetime ISA, but again, there are some restrictions on that product which uh, don't make it that attractive and more needs to be done, and we are indeed campaigning uh, for that. Uh, the other ones, if I could quickly cover, 100-year life, it's something that is well established, people are living longer. Clearly there's a need to address the needs of people li living longer, but we have to think very differently about uh, how we can adapt our working practices, because people will have to work longer too, and how we can encourage that. Uh, and again, as a mutual, we, we have to uh, play a greater uh, part in that. Working revolution, uh, that's the fourth trend, and that is where whether it's the advent of AI or whether it's the working practices post-pandemic, uh, there are a number of things that we need uh, to address. When it comes to AI, and this, I'm talking about this research, which is probably before, the, before chat GBT became you know, the next uh, be uh, best thing since sliced bread, but uh, the, uh, the government research suggested that over the next 20 years, nine million jobs would be displaced. Uh, the word displaced was used, they won't be lost, they're just different kind of jobs. Um, and again, we, the, one of the things we are doing in the organization is actually using AI to help our people in their training and skilling and to make them more effective. Um, and so we, we, we are addressing the working revolution. And the finally, uh, electric living, as we call it, uh, which is uh, addressing climate change. We have, through our listening to our customers, uh, we have a panel called Smart Money. Mostly it's teenagers. If you come to our office in Brighton, you will find teenagers uh, sitting in some of our breakout areas because we get feedback from them. They said they just want climate strategy funds. So that's what we offer. We don't offer any other funds for our new products. Uh, and that's how we are listening and responding uh, uh, to the, uh, the customer. That we, and that's what makes us different, the listening point that Nehal was talking about. Mm -hmm. Finally, if I could make one more point, which is we give voice to the voiceless. And an example of that is um, a child trust fund when they mature. Individuals which have challenges with mental capacity, uh, the procedure for them to access that money was to go to the court of protection. 90 pages of forms, paying for GP consultation, court fees, and whatnot this to withdraw funds which on average are 2,300 pounds. Uh, we have been campaigning to make that process easier to the extent that of our own bad, we have said we are not going to follow that process and we are going to make it easy and take the risk that somebody might say, what are you doing? But we have openly done that and the rest of the industry has followed what we have done. 
uh, but we are campaigning for that issue to make it simpler and, 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 and frankly, remove some of, the, some of the bureaucracy that's there. So giving voice to the voiceless is clearly a core part of what you do. Uh, look, you know, this is an era of, in economic terms, it's called wicked problems. These are problems, they don't have a perfect solution. <laughs> um, and, and the only way to address uh, these problems is through listening, through collaboration. And those are the two things we can, as a mutual, absolutely do. Uh, we do it all the time at One Family, but I think we need to do more. I'm really enjoying the language that you're using there, Jim. You know, listening, voice, journey, talking, hearing. And it takes us back to what, you know, Nihal was saying this morning about listening and hearing and, and what Kenyatta was saying too, about how it's, it's a kind of a double-edged thing, isn't it? So you have to listen, but you have to hear, and you have to respond as well. So, I mean, Kevin, does this sound familiar to you? Because you're another one from, um, you know, Mutual. You've got two hats, Nationwide and Royal London, but they're two quite different organisations. Yes, I'm sure just about everybody's familiar with Nationwide. So uh, we're one of the... Uh, systemically important banking groups, 16 million or so customers, so about a quarter of the adult population uh, is looked after by Nationwide. Royal London might be slightly less familiar, it's got about 4 million customers, and that's uh, about um, uh, life assurance, protection, a bit like Jim, and, uh, but also uh, pensions, which is probably its core business, and in particular workplace pensions. Uh, so the way we look at it in both is quite similar. We're always focused on the customers. The customers are the members. And the difference, I think, that is so important in a mutual, whatever its legal form, we might come back to that, but it is that everything you're doing is the benefit of the members. There's no other uh, shareholder that you need to give a return to. And in both organizations, we're able to do that in two ways. One, to give finer pricing. So if you're depositing money with Nationwide, you will on average get a better interest rate than you will elsewhere. Uh, if you're borrowing from us, you'll on average get a better uh, borrowing rate than elsewhere. But it's more than that. It's also service. So we've got the best service out of any banking organization in this country, number one. And we think that is also part of being mutual because people value service. We also keep it close to people, so we, we, we're committed to keeping our branches open for the foreseeable future. That allows people, when they've got moments that they perhaps don't understand what they're doing, or perhaps they're not confident to do things online, but actually the main time people come in is for big transactions. What is a mortgage? How do I, how do I get one? I want to borrow money to buy a car. How do I, how do, I do it? Or family events. I'm getting married got children, getting divorced, my parents have died, or one of them has died. All of those times, people like to have human interaction. And we see that as a very important differentiator for being a mutual. So it's more than just the products. In both organizations, though, we also give a dividend at the, uh, at the end of the year. So a lot of you might, if you, uh, probably quite a fair few nationwide customers in here, I would imagine, I would hope so anyway, you might have had 100 pounds into your bank account in the last few days uh, as, as the, uh, the fairer share reward. Um, and in Royal London, we increase the value of policies. So another distribution that goes back to members. Nobody that, isn't, that is not a mutual, if you're not a mutual, you won't be doing that. So you get an added benefit. So I think the, there are enormous focus on the individual and interestingly in terms of the, Jim's point on inclusivity in both organizations we also think about those who can't easily mm. be customers of ours so in nationwide we do an awful lot of support for homelessness our main job is giving mortgages people have houses there is there's also a bottom end of society that very sadly are homeless so we we do a lot of work there and we, we also do work in health, for example, in Royal London. We do life policies. The biggest cause of uh, death is cancer. 60-odd percent of the population will experience it at some stage during their life. So we give a, a lot of money to, uh, to, to cancer research in our, in our case. So 1% of our profits go back to those that are not able to easily be customers, members of ours. So really important differences, in my view, uh, for being a mutual. Mm. I think that, that's really powerful, the idea of being the, the benefit for the member. And I guess, Sheila, as a dairy co-op, with the farmers as your members, that's, that's quite something you witness daily. 
Uh, yes, I mean, we are uh, as a as a. Let me just talk a little bit about 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 mm -hmm. the business. So as a Terry Cooperative, uh, we've got uh, about seven hundred farmer members uh, across Scotland, uh, England, and, and Wales. Um, and they're farmers, but they are families. And I think that is an important element of being part of a, a cooperative. Um, some of the things that uh, you know we, we think about in terms of you know how do, how does it affect the business that we run and how we how we operate. Um, you know the co-op ethos is very very central to the business. It really is to, uh, runs to the heart of it. Um, for us, it's about how, you know, how do we engage with our members and how do we how do we how do we talk to them. Um, it's about, you know, our, our business is about trying to create long-term value uh, for those family farms. I think it's been important for us to be able to do that in a way that demonstrates, you know, fairness and integrity and treating everybody equitably across um, all, all members uh, of it. So as, as a member, it's quite different in terms of it, mutual in, in the sense that our, our members have invested in the business, so a typical Farmer owner uh, has invested about seventy thousand pounds in in the business, um, so they really are genuine uh, part owners, um, <clears throat> and they're very much along the you know on the journey. I think what's been really important is building that trust and confidence uh, of, uh, of of membership uh, in a cooperative. People have to feel, and we've talked about it a lot, about uh, being listened to. So. One of the things that, that we have done as a business over the years is do a lot of listening. So we do each year a sort of survey across our membership and the way we act on it. And I think that has helped hugely build that trust and confidence because people can see that changes have been made across the business um, that have responded directly <coughs> to what, uh, what they have been asking for. There's also elected representation. I think that's really important to get that voice heard. So you're getting people around the table and listening to, uh, you know, what their views are and being able to then, you know, move the business in a direction that that, that works for them. Um, I think what, one of the one of the areas that uh, I suppose our, our our role is, I feel, in terms of driving driving the business forward, is is really trying to help members, in particular farmers. Deal with what does the market what does the market want and trying to guide them uh, to be able to, to do that. There was talk earlier about a broken housing system. You could say, and it has been used about uh, there being a broken food system as well. So a number of years ago, our business looked at that and thought, okay, how can we do something about that? So we launched a regenerative farming program. So all our members, um, we, we sort of have been on this uh, journey to adopt regenerative farming practices, really trying to help them respond to climate change and become uh, more resilient within their, their farming systems. Um, as part of that also, I think, you know, we looked at uh, how do we build on that in terms of our purpose. We became a, a certified B Corp um, last year as well. And I think that's been interesting in, you know, so our members understand why we're trying to do things and, and how that helps them create value and build resilience in the long term. But the, one of the points on here was how do you then tell that story to customers and uh, the general public and consumers? And I think that's very, very different. And I thought the earlier sister, uh, se uh, session was really interesting. Most people don't really uh, understand or care about whether you're a cooperative or a mutual, that, that's really almost irrelevant to them. What they want to know is what outcome are you having? What impact are you having? And the only way you can relay that is through storytelling. And I think that's been something that I've found increasingly powerful to be able to talk to consumers in a way that demonstrates to them what what supporting local farmers means, both in terms of how their food is being produced, you know, so provenance, the farming system, how it can be part of a climate solution, what it's doing for biodiversity, um, but, but also, um, you know, connecting them to, to the local community and the impact that they're having on rural communities and the support that they uh, give in terms of that local economy. So, 
telling stories, bringing it to life for them, running, uh, you know, involving schools locally is something that we have increasingly done to get in amongst the community, having big uh, open farm sessions where you're bringing maybe a thousand people onto the farm to experience it and to bring it to life. And that, to me, is living and breathing, working together and showing the power of coming together as a cooperative to, uh, you know, have a real impact. That's really interesting, actually, because what you're saying about most don't care that it's a mutual, but they, it sounds like they really care what you're doing. And I guess you're doing that because you're a mutual and because you put emphasis on, on your farmer members. So, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's yeah, really interesting. Um, I liked what you're talking about as well, about being listened to and then, then acting, and that's something you're very much doing at the Co-op Group, Shireen. Yeah, so I'm, I'm lucky to follow uh, Kenyatta <laughs> on this, so he's already told you part of the story. Uh, so for anyone who doesn't know, and I see a lot of people who do know our Co-op very well, uh, we have our retail food business, we have our wholesale business, uh, and then uh, we have our B2B function that also has uh, franchise within it. Uh, we run a funeral business, legal services and insurance businesses as well. So we've got a, a really interesting portfolio um, of, of, of different um, types of ways to engage with our members. So when I took on this role a couple of years ago and as a new CEO you do have the luxury of stopping and saying right what is this thing I'm now responsible for? Uh, where did we come from? And uh, Rose spoke about how I dragged my whole team <laughs> to where it all started in Toad Lane. Um, I had read the book on cooperation. I'd made them all read it, you know, um, and we learned where we came from. And where we came from was a member-based organization that mm. absolutely dominated the food industry, uh, you know, for, for many, many years until about the 1950s, 1960s. And when you drill down to how that domination happened, it was because of the membership. And it was about really understanding what their members wanted and delivering on that. So uh, in this process, we developed a new group strategy. Membership is absolutely central to that. Our new uh, vision is about cooperating to deliver more value for our members, uh, owners every day. And we ensured that not only our leadership understood this, but we cascaded it down first through the first 5,000 people uh, in our organization in terms of leadership, and then out to all 56,000 to ensure that people really understood what a cooperative was. We're on a journey. It's very hard when you run a retail operation with the turnover that you've got to make sure everybody understands it. So we do need to, to continue working on that. And because we have lots of analytical types on our leadership team, <laughs> including me, I had to drill down into what is membership and where does member value come from. And we've broken it into three elements. The first is economic value, the next is social value, and then ownership value. So we have gone out and we've spoken a lot with our members, and frankly, the co-op group did do that quite a bit, but we've been much more focused in what we've been asking our members. And when we asked our members what was really important to them, it was during the cost of living uh, situation. And uh, we decided that we were gonna focus first on economic value. Kenyatta was with us by then, um, Matt Hood was running our food business, so they worked hand in hand to say, how can we absolutely deliver the best prices possible to our members? Um, one thing that I loved about what Kenyatta said was that there is an element of bravery mm. that comes in if you're willing to grasp it when you are a member-owned organization. And there were a few things that we did along the way. So, for example, we had been rewarding people 2% uh, on every own brand product that they earned and then 2% into communities. We stopped doing that. The 2% into communities and, um, equated to about 20 to 24 million pounds uh, directly into community uh, uh, causes that our members cared about. We ring-fenced that, we held it. 
but the 2% that they got back on own brand, we delivered directly at point of sale to our members, which ended up being about 500 pounds more per year for our members. Mm -hmm. Now we're get hearing a lot from our members again through the ownership element, and we're hearing that some people don't want it right there. They actually enjoyed the savings of their points. So we're looking at whether people can toggle back and forth. But what I've loved about going into the ownership piece, which uh, Dom kindly leads for us, is we've been able to do some very different things. So for example, we put our AGM voting onto our app. Um, and that resulted in uh, voting going up by 38% because people were able to access it more easily. We've surveyed our members to say, right, we're working on our social value strategy. What is really important to you? So there is so much more of a conversation now that's, that's going on. Uh, we know that one thing that's very important to our members is around sustainability. And just back to this bravery point, not having to um, report to shareholders, being mm -hmm. able to report to your members who do own your business, and our members are our colleagues as well as those who are our consumers. Um, they told us that sustainability is very important. So one thing we did early on is we said, right, you know, how are we actually delivering sustainability? And one thing that we found was that we claim to be a carbon neutral business through the purchase of Rigos. Then you drill down to the next level mm. and you ask, well, what are these Rigos? Well, actually, they funded a PPA at some point, but now they're just traded. And they're bits of paper that may not actually relate to the green source of the original transaction. So we pulled out of those. Could you just explain what Rigos are for anyone who doesn't uh, understand? Right. So <coughs> Sorry. basically... <laughs> Oh, there are going to be people around here that go, no, that's not it. Um, you, it it's, it's basically saying that um, if you invest in a, a green project around green energy or, or something like that, um, you get a certificate saying that um, that, that investment has happened. Mm -hmm. Now, that certificate can then be traded like a stock in the open market. So if you buy that certificate, you have actually bought an investment, a piece of paper, but that does not mean that you have actually done the investment. Neither does it mean that your organization and the way that you run it is sustainable. Mm. Um, so you know, when you're member owned, you can have a very honest conversation that says, you told us this is important. We're not gonna whitewash this. We're not gonna pretend. And you know, Grace talked about mm. that earlier. Yeah. And if you know, it's a, it's our business. We're not going to pretend to be something we're not. So, and and you know, uh, our AGM was very interesting for anyone who was there. You know, we were. I was stormed on the stage <laughs> by the and the, the chicken protesters, who are the loveliest people. You know, they apologized as they were coming up onto the stage. Um, but you know, there, there are some organizations that have signed a better chicken commitment just mm -hmm. to make that noise stop. And what we said to the protesters is until we know exactly how we're gonna deliver it, and until we can look our members in the eye and say we're signing this thing, and we know how we're going to deliver it, and we can afford it. I'm sorry, we're not going to do it. So I'll be seeing them on stage, I think, you know, <laughs> regularly until we get to that point. Mm. But it really, that, that conversation with our members, the real focus on it, and then the way you run your business thereafter, I think is fundamentally different for organizations in, this, um, in the mutual and cooperative space than they would be in the straight corporate. Mm. We're very lucky today have not one, but two representatives from the dairy industry. Um, reflecting on what Shireen said around this issue of dialogue, um, Paul, yep. what are your thoughts on this? Because how yeah, do you do that at scale? Because ours is huge. <laughs> yeah. if, you, uh, if you want dialogue and feedback, go and work for a farmer owned cooperative, is, uh, is what, I, what I'd say. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about, about Arla first of all, and then I'll, I'll mm -hmm. tackle that question. It really fascinates me about bravery, and I'll talk about saying no, which is, which is quite a challenge in a, in a democratic co op. So, Arla, Arla Foods, um, we are a uh, uh, dairy. Uh, we uh, employ 4,000 people in the UK. Um, we have some of the brands that you hopefully eat. Um, just let's take butter. If you are from this area, you might, you might eat Anchor butter, if you've, which is ours. If you live in the north, you might eat Lurpak. But you can eat anything where you want. But we used to bring, <laughs> we bring Lurpak, you traditionally brought Lurpak in to the northern ports and Anchor from the southern ports. So we've got some real interesting regional preferences. Um, 
farmer-owned cooperative, 2,000 farmers in the UK, 8,000 in Europe. Um, we run elections every two years, um, and um, yeah, we, we, have, uh, we, are, we aim to add value to every litre of milk. That's, that's why we exist. The milk price is set by our farmer owners. Um, and yeah, we, uh, we have a real purpose, which is about adding value and, and doing good things. And I think we all do good things as cooperatives and mutuals, wherever we are, I think that's a common thread that comes through us. Uh, we want to make affordable nutrition uh, through what we do on our, on our farms. That um, question around, um, what, let's get into what, what it means to operate as a cooperative. Um, we're able to make decisions that are a bit more longer term. We're not beholden to kind of short term reporting to the city. We're not beholden to um, turning a profit uh, other than the 3% we promise. So every year, all we, all we want to do is retain 3% um, and the rest goes to our farmer owners. So um, some of that 3% goes into investments. The investments that we're able to make uh, are for the long term. So uh, we've made 300 million pounds worth of investments th this year um, uh, in the U UK dairy industry, which signals there's a real future in an area where there is a declining liquid milk consumption. So we're giving faith to our member owners. They're on the journey with us to make those investment decisions as well. Every decision that we make on investment is run through our board of directors who are farmers. Um, we spent, we are investing 179 million, for example, in a, in a, in a site that is going to use British milk to export mozzarella internationally. So, um, but it's, sometimes it's the difficult decisions that really put the and stress test the, whether you've got a good democracy or not. And, and it's my job to run the democracy in the UK as agriculture director. Uh, so communication, uh, interaction, feedback, listening is, is unbelievably important. But when you've heard all that and then you still say, do you know what, we're going to do this. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you t t t an example. Um, plant-based butter. I mean, if you, you tell a, a farmer we're going to make plant-based butter as the, the biggest dairy out there, it's not a popular decision amongst all, <laughs> shall we say. Um, but we identified it was the right thing to do, and we, we hope it will be. Um, if we get it wrong, we'll, we'll revert. But, but, you know, we make difficult decisions, um, and we're informed, we're informed of those decisions uh, it, with real closeness. Uh, to our farmer owners, it's, it's visceral and real. Um, I was, let me tell you a story, I was in the, I, it was raining when I arrived. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't rain all the time in Birmingham, but it, it was raining when I arrived. So I had to sit in the car and I was on a call around our organic uh, challenges. There's challenges in the organic market at the moment in the UK. The Financial Times ran a story last week that uh, the supply is dropping, our farmer owners need some faith. So I was on a call in the, in the car park uh, with a farmer talking to the, the biggest person you've got in Arla about the challenges in, in organic. So it, it's the interaction, that connectivity has to happen. The challenges come when you, you're in difficult circumstances and you, you're saying no. It's good when you're saying yes and the milk price is high. Uh, it's, it's more tricky when you're saying no um, or when you're asking them to do other things. The sustainability with journey we've been on, and I know, I know Sheila's on as well and Shireen, mm -hmm. and everybody here has to has to prioritise sustainability. Um, asking farmers to do things on farm because you, you, there's a future, the future demands that we are responsible um, is, a, is a tough ask, especially when we've got, we, we're in a low milk price, which we were last year when we landed our sustainability incentive model. Um, so yeah, you've got to be transparent. That's what I've learned. Trust and confidence was something you said, Sheila. I think we share that. We share that. We're making decisions together um, and, and being trusted and confident that we're making the right decisions is key. Uh, we temperature check that trust and confidence with our farmer owners every year with a survey, but I'm responsible for a European project that every month we're, we're asking questions around trust, confidence, what are we doing, what can we do better? Um, uh, and we do that as well through the, the elected farmers as well, 130 elected farmer owners who work in the districts to help, help all of us share that, those messages. 
Paul, I'm really glad you used the D word, democracy. We we're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, but from the show of hands at the start, three of you could tell the difference between co-ops and mutuals. I think it's fair to say that it's hard to explain any difference. Um, but then there was also community ownership, there's employee ownership, there's social enterprises. And I was talking to Rosa about this early on. I said, Rose, how would you, how would you describe the difference? And for Cops UK, and someone can put their hand up if I'm getting this wrong, Emma, <laughs> tell me. Um, the difference comes down to ownership versus control. How all co-ops are mutuals, but not all mutuals are co-ops, because not all mutuals are controlled by their members. They don't have that democracy piece. But are we thinking about this the wrong way? Do we need to be explaining the difference, or does this just get in the way of doing the cooperation, doing the mutual activity? I know a few of you here have quite strong opinions on this, so Jim, we'll start with you again. Are we thinking about this all wrong? I think, um, <clears throat> well, we, we have to put ourselves in the shoes of the society, um, rather than, you know, yes, legal structures, company structures, very interesting for our lawyers and accountants and various other people, but at the end of the day, uh, it's what matters is as what are we doing, how we are doing it, and therefore the purpose is extremely important. I mean, I'm on uh, 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 the CEO of One Family, which is a mutual. I'm a non-exec on another board, uh, which is not technically mutual. It's a company limited by guarantee, but again, people's partnership, it does people's pension, six million members. Um, and that is, again, a purpose-led organization. Mm -hmm. I don't see the difference between the two from a customer perspective, because that organization is trying to do exactly the same, providing low-cost, simple, accessible products, in that case, <coughs> pensions. Um, so I, I frankly, I think this, this is really interesting to us. Uh, but from a customer perspective, from a society perspective, I don't think that makes any difference. And that is where I think the challenge for us is why do we think of ourselves as a cooperative or a mutual or a mm. building society? I think there's a, and what, what it also does, it, I think it reduces our influence. It reduces the impact we are making in society. Uh, and I think, um, when, when I think about what's happened post COVID, one of the key changes we, we have seen is it's actually becoming easier to recruit. Mm -hmm. Younger people in particular, and, and, and in fact, you know, um, uh, sort of older as well, there's a general desire to work for a purpose-led organization and make a difference in society. Uh, that message is getting out there. Our time is now when I look at it, given all the challenges we have. So why can't we be bolder? Why can't we just remove all these, if I can call them, shackles of various corporate structures and really get the message out there? in terms of the impact we are making in society and the responsibilities that we have and what we can do more of. That way we'll have a greater voice uh, with the government, uh, with the various stakeholders, uh, and I think then we can address some of what I would call the fundamental challenges that we have. Because look, at the end of the day, we have to run these organizations in a very commercial way. I mean, I almost say that being a cooperative or a mutual, there's a greater responsibility around running the organization in a commercial way. So profit is not a bad thing. That is what we invest, and that is what we invest in the society. Uh, but in order uh, to create that kind of further investment, capital is a constraint for a mutual, because we have to live within our mm. means. But those are areas that we could campaign together about. And I know that AFM and uh, <coughs> Co-op UK and others, they've uh, recently had made some inroads there. And I think that's where we need to think about working together and not be in our uh, silos, if I can put it that way. So I, I, I just don't think it matters from the society or customer's perspective. I think you might be right. And Kevin, I know you had similar thoughts on this about the need to speak with one voice. I do, I do <coughs> and I, I think it's actually particularly important. Uh, the Labour Party manifesto has, as far as I can see, been true to what's been well trailed in terms of looking to double the size of the mutual sector. And I think if we are to achieve that, it's very important we don't focus on the differences between a company limited by guarantee, a building society, uh, a co-op, etc., because it's a level of detail that is not likely to be understood by the average member of parliament or indeed the average civil servant. Mm -hmm. So my view is very much we should focus on the similarities, which I think are much greater than the differences between the different legal forms. And if we do that, I think we will uh, be able to take uh, the sector considerably forward. There's two 
enormous transactions going on at the moment. You've already mentioned uh, Coventry bringing the co-op back into the mutual sector, which I think is great. Um, nationwide, we're bringing Virgin back into the mutual sector. You know, it used to be things like Northern Rock, which were building societies in their day. So we do seem to be on a roll as a sector, but I think we've got to help the politicians to help us. And you know, one of the other things that I'm very keen on is that uh, we have a minister who has responsibilities for mutuals. It might not be the only thing he or she does, but I think if we had somebody that was focused on it, then there'll be civil servants focused on it, and therefore I think we can really help society and think more widely about what we do. I also agree quite strongly with the need to make profit, because by making profit, you reinvest into it and you're able to expand the sector. So it shouldn't ever be thought of as a dirty word. It is, it is, it is there for good, good purposes, and it is all reinvested back into, into the members. So I think we should never be mixed up with a not-for-profit or a charity. We're not mm. that. They exist, of course, uh, but that's really not what most mutual, mutuals are about. So, yeah, getting, getting the similarities, I would say, rather than one, oh, you know, a, a co-op, you get, you get a, a political vote, you don't get one in a building society, it doesn't matter. Sheila, what's your thoughts on this? Because you, you mentioned that you're registered as a B Corp as well, and there's all these different labels and different you said, uh, legal forms. What, what are your thoughts on this? I, I'm probably of a similar view. I, I actually don't... I, it's like how you cut and dice uh, different, different sectors or different businesses, different markets, and I think you have to cut through all of that in terms of what are we all trying to achieve. How we are structured or owned or operate is different. And I think it also goes back to the discussion earlier on, which I found fascinating between Grace and some of the other people, where we talk about there are people in the world that have been driven by um, entrepreneurs and you know, the mm. capitalist society we've had since the 80s, and it's driven that. And in that panel, somebody was saying, well, I don't, I don't think that's always the case. We are intrinsically uh, <coughs> collaborators. I, I don't believe that. I, I think there are, there are all sorts across there. In the same way, there's all sorts of businesses. There's all sorts of people. Some are purely driven for themselves as individuals, and others want to be able to um, uh, collaborate. I think as a, as a country, we're not very good collaborators. I think that whenever I look at co-ops, co-ops here in the UK have had a bad, certainly from an agricultural point of view, have had a really difficult and checkered history. If you go to other parts in Europe, they're much more successful. There's a much more coherent approach and belief in cooperative living. So what's happened here in the UK is different. And I think then, therefore, it's a much greater challenge for us to move forward if we want to genuinely um, collaborate. So I would cut through it and say it's people who have a purpose, businesses who have a purpose, who want to use business as a force for good. And I think that's another way of maybe phrasing it. And that can gather up all sorts of businesses. And it could be in, in different walks of life, different sectors, different industries. One of the reasons why we went to, to become a certified B Corp is it, it is a different, um, it's another body that's trying to do something similar. And it doesn't matter which walk of life you've come from. You can, you can go to try to be a, uh, become a certified B Corp. And that's about, I think, trying to get businesses and people to rewire how we're wired. Businesses and people have genuinely or have been hardwired into making decisions based on financial outcomes. It's quite a natural thing. Now it is important to make financial outcomes, but part of I think this using business as a force for good is about trying to think about what is the impact that your decisions have on both financial <coughs> but also people and planet. And that's the whole three P's issue that we've been trying to engender um, in, into. And I'm sure if we talked here, you know, those are things that increasingly you want to be able to get that balance right. Yes, you have to have money to invest, because that's, that's a prime. They often say you can't be green if you're in the red. Um, and I think it is a bit like that. You've got to be able to show that you can commercially m make a viable business and a resilient business. But when you get there, you then have the ability to make choices. And so therefore, I, to me, it's not whether you're a co-op or a mutual. In fact, if you went onto the street, I'm not too sure people would even know what a co-op was. But that's how low I think the understanding is. It's more about purpose, what we're trying to... And I totally agree with you in terms of, as an employer, 
we are seeing increasingly people wanting to work for a business that have got a purpose. They want to know why we're doing things and, and what, what's it all about and what impact are you having. Um, yeah. It's, it's fascinating what you're talking about, um, about cops working together and cooperating around principle six. I remember when I first joined the cop movement, it was ironically said that the problem with the cop movement is it doesn't cooperate and it doesn't move. And I really think that has changed now. People are working better together. Principle six is far more visible. And I can definitely see that in the cop group, Shereen. Um, so I, I think <coughs> I come from a slightly different place than, um, you know, than my colleagues here have come from, but I will end up in the same place. So don't worry, don't worry, we're not going to fall out. Um, I, I fundamentally believe in the concept of a cooperative. I fundamentally believe that you do have a different kind of business when, the, when your consumers own that business and have the ability to guide that business in the direction that it fe they feel that it should go, and they have a sense of ownership. Uh, so that I absolutely believe in. I absolutely believe in the values and principles as well, and the fact that cooperatives everywhere, not just in this country, but globally, adhere to those same values and principles. And you know, Rose, you'll say there'll be different levels of adherence and who's gonna audit it, but it's all there for all of us. And I think that that makes us a different kind of organization. Now, the owner control, I think, has a real societal value right now. We, it was just, um, I mean, I read, I read today that the, uh, that the British public has its lowest confidence in in government mm -hmm. right now and in, and in business. You know, people do not have confidence. Young people don't necessarily feel listened to. I mean, you see some of the protests that are happening out there. You see how young people are feeling marginalized. And I think that there is a real place for owner-controlled businesses that do good and serve their members at this moment, not just in this UK, in, in this country, uh, but globally. However, having said all of that, sometimes cooperation is difficult. And you know, within, within the cooperative sector, within retail here, we've had some huge successes. You know, for example, jointly buying, jointly distributing, being able to gain competitive advantage for us from that. We've looked at other areas and we've been a little less successful because we differ in scale, we differ in our objectives. Um, so I, I, I think that it is important to recognize that sort of difference, at least that's what I'm doing. Now, in terms of cooperatives and mutuals working together on things that we should be banding uh, together on to make a real difference, I think that is important. One example, raising capital. We cannot go out and issue shares like our competitors can to raise capital. And you know, I sit on a different board as well, and I'm fascinated at, you know, you can just raise capital like that. Um, but you know, we must, in order for us to compete, we must be able to come together on things like that. And approaching government collectively, I think, is also very important. You know, we, we have, we're probably going to get a new government um, that the cabinet will have a number of cooperative party members mm -hmm. on. So these people actually get it, and they've made the sort of declaration that, that you've mentioned for a good reason. They yeah. know that by working with the cooperative and the mutual sector, you can make big changes that government doesn't necessarily have to lead. So, uh, so that's, that's my, if I can just add one other mm. thing, I do think that we can go more broadly as well. So I, I was just uh, saying um, earlier that, you know, I, I chair the Net Zero Council with the Minister for Net Zero, and what I found in retail was that there were pockets of activity everywhere. Mm. And so I came into this and said, well, why don't we cooperate? <laughs> why don't we put it all under one umbrella? Why don't we bring the farmers in with the retailers? And instead of the retailers saying, you must be more green, and we're not going to pay you any more for it, why don't we have the decision making at one table? And I was actually surprised at how some of these very big, very commercial corporates said, well, actually, that might work. So I feel like that was a win for cooperation <laughs> without perhaps anyone knowing about it. But it does change the way you work. It makes you bigger than the whole, big, bigger than the individual parts. Mm. Dick. <laughs> um, Paul, what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> well, that was inspirational, uh, your summary there. Um, we were at the farm to fork. Um, event at Downing Street and we shared the same energy coming out of that room I've, and, and there, is, there is I think a, a sea change 
Um, I'm very optimistic about, about what came out of that. Um, I feel a bit guilty, um, in all honesty. Um, so we're the third biggest food company in the country, and we, we don't really talk about being a co-op very well, I don't think. We're, we're, we, we've reduced, uh, made massive strides on our carbon reduction, um, and we've got some bold targets. Um, um, we've, um, we're winning contracts with, with um, retailers, food service customers. Um, we're acquiring organisations based on us being a cooperative. Um, we're, the hedgerows in Cornwall are looked after by people who are in our cooperative. I, um, but we don't, I don't think we're talking enough or working together enough, and I feel bad about that. Um, but I, I'm here today to symbolically join that movement. I think we can do more. Um, I think you know, Shireen's words there around cooperating uh, would, be, would be more powerful. We're, we've all, I'm sure all of us around this table have taken politicians around our sites or whatever we've done as, in the lead up to the election. Um, and whenever I describe what we do, uh, you can feel a twinkle in the eye of, of people who want to work with us on the back of what we do as cooperatives, mutual societies, whatever. We're just on a different place. Accessing finance is not meant that we've need to, needed to probably engage on, on this, on this mutual, uh, mutual platform before, but um, here today to, uh, to join the movement. Well, I like that you built the symbolically joined. Hopefully we'll get to actually join in more as well. That'd be oh, good. Yeah, yeah, I will pay that invoice. <laughs> I know, she keeps sending me the invoice. Yeah, it'll happen. <laughs> Um, we've already seen some joint work on lobbying. I know Corps UK and the BSA, NABCO and the AFM, Association for Financial Mutuals, sent a joint letter um, to the leaders of the political parties with cooperative and mutual asks. So there is some joint activity happening already. We've got five minutes and 11 seconds left of my slotted time. So just really quickly, what else can we do? What practical actions can we take? And then hopefully we'll have time for a couple of questions first. We'll go left to right, so Jim first. I think, what can we uh, do? Um, um, the, I think the, your, your point around talking more about it is important. I think it is important not that we should bang our own drums, but I think in terms of the impact we make on society uh, so that there is a greater dialogue and engagement with us so that we can make an even greater difference. So in, in that respect, I think the associations should really work together, AFM, Building Society, uh, and also Co-op UK. I think there should be a joint strategy around communication because the message needs to get out there. I didn't know Lupa, Lupac was a cooperative. I do buy that butter. Mm. <laughs> that was, uh, I will learn something today. Yeah, I, <laughs> so I think we, we, we need to talk about this more, yes. Sheila. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe similar. So two things I'd say, uh, become a B Corp, <laughs> and join the community. And then I think that's a, a really helpful way of uh, talking to like-minded businesses. But I think the, the stat that Somebody had, I think Rose had said earlier on about uh, the 7,000 cooperatives, and we're only 1% of, I wasn't sure what the 1% was, but it seemed a very small figure. And I thought, we are so small uh, across there, so really somehow we have to, you know, uh, elevate our own voice. And I've always had a great concept of a co-op of co-ops, because I think, you know, bringing us somehow together to be able to, um, you know, com promote what we do is, is going to be hugely important, spread the word. Thank you. I, I don't have anything new to, to add to that, so I'll just agree. Okay. <laughs> and Kevin and Paul. Uh, to, my, to my mind, the, the access to capital <coughs> is really important. It, it's fine for me at Nationwide or Royal London, being very big, we can raise capital, but the vast majority of smaller mutuals cannot, and they will not be able to grow the sector without access to capital. There are some good models uh, existing in other parts of the world. Australia's got a model that you can raise capital, but you don't have to dilute the membership. So you, you can take it in. And I think we need some law changes, some innovative thinking there. And I think that would make a huge difference to the sector. We wouldn't particularly benefit, but I think we can certainly bring, we've had some discussions with Rose and others in terms of our experiences to how, how that can be brought to the sector as a whole. So I would say you can't do it without money, frankly. Mm. I'd, say, I'd say tell good stories. Um, Society is wary and weary, and we are, we're, a, we're a beacon of goodness within that. Uh, I don't want to sound naive or cheesy, but we, we are. Uh, it'll help us recruit people, purpose-driven people. It'll help us sell more. Let's not be shy of profit. Uh, it'll help us invest better and wiser. 
uh, it'll, it'll, we'll, do, we'll do a job for society if we do that. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody. So there you have it. We need more dialogue, joint communication strategy, join a B Corp, access to capital, feel good stories, tell good stories, and be a beacon of goodness. So thank you very much, panel. <laughs> 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 no, so I'm going to try and do two questions. Do we have time for two questions? Is that okay? Have we got any questions? We've got is that Robin over there. Robin, please. Th thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, we've been talking a lot about bravery this morning, and I was, I was taken with Rose's opening comments about Royal Mail and Thames Water. How brave is the sector, do you think, prepared to be in that inclusivity? For example, in embracing concept of very large public sector, public service mutuals. So you know, when we're talking about doubling the size of the economy, the, the cooperative and mutual economy, actually how, how ambitious are we prepared to be in putting our differences aside and uniting around something like that? Who wants to take that? Go on. Well, I, 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 I agree with you, Robin. I think we absolutely should be. Um, the, there is clearly a lot of public service issues across the country that need to be addressed and I think if you put them into the mutual sector and therefore whatever profits comes from water whatever it is gets pushed back into the investment into water that would be a marvelous way forward enormously complex these are really big businesses but if you do look if you like at my end of the mutual sector we're, we're used to really complex big businesses and I would absolutely say uh, the next government should c contemplate uh, forming that and drawing on the skill sets that do exist in this sector. Thank you. Gentleman over there, sorry, I can't see with the lights. <laughs> Could you introduce yourself as well? Yeah, uh, my name is Andy Walsh. I'm from the um, Football Supporters Association um, and I've been involved in co ops most of my adult life. Um, I'm proud of the co op movement and um, I'm a little bit. Um, a little bit of caution to some of the speakers on the panel talking about how ownership's not necessarily as important as it should be. Um, I'm a member of Nationwide. Um, I consider myself a member, not just a customer. Um, I do buy Lurpak and Anchor Butter, and I didn't know you were a co-op. Um, I do spend my money in, in co-op shops when I can. Um, my question really is, um, I'm a bit disappointed in the Labour Party manifesto, to be honest, in terms of its limited, co limited cooperative comments. Three times co-ops are mentioned. We, as a movement, need to hold the Labour Party to their, uh, their roots, in, uh, uh, which partly are bedded in our movement. Um, I would just ask um, a quick answer from, from, uh, from each of the panel. Are you willing to redouble? The, if the Labour Party coming into power wish to double the economy, are you willing to redouble your efforts to make your members more relevant in your businesses? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <Sorry. laughs> yes. I don't see how you, how you could do otherwise because that's why we exist. Mm -hmm. Any other, what, what, one more question before we break for lunch? Are we all good? I think we're good. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. Thank you. <laughs> well done, well done. Well done.